Um, since Paul is new to the group, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on the Crypt Track Club and why it was started. I actually, it was an idea that was downloaded to me in response to the quarantine. So quarantine hit and literally two days later, it, well, it hit in Hawaii. It, it, Hawaii was late in the game, but it hit on a Monday. Two days later, I got this idea, like, you should start a Zoom call, community call. Um, and I did. Uh, I didn't know what it would look like or how it would evolve, but it has evolved into something really beautiful. And if you know Tylea Paul, um, you know, she's an amazing woman herself. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this has really attracted amazing, fabulous people who are like movers and shakers in their local community and are now coming together. And we're actually together we're stronger and we're able to make more even a, a broader impact um i mean if we look at it i'm from the other side of the pacific in hawaii we have paul and denise in california and priya all the way all the way on the east coast um in northern california and north carolina so i feel like we meet the gap and we need to get international we have midwest people we have floridians so yeah it's really great yes absolutely so um, and hopefully people will come in and, and be able to join us as we go. I really thought this would be a hot topic and people would be like, I'm there. Um, but, but we'll, we'll, have to to it. To we'll have to redo it another time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring it back. Well, and we are going to do part two next week about, cause I just felt like that there, it's never really talked about, but I do feel like there is a distinction between men with disabilities and their experience with dating versus women with disabilities and their experience with dating. So next week, we're actually going to dive in into the distinction between men and women um, for people with disabilities. It will be interesting to see if we have anyone who ha is um, who identifies with LG the LGBTQ community and to see what their experience is too, because that's a whole other community. And I, I'd be willing to, if there's anyone that could speak on that, um, I'd be willing to hear what their experiences are. Like, is it easier in the LGBTQ community? I don't know, but um, it's not my community. It's not, it's not, I'm not in that, that community. So I, I would be interested in hearing the perspectives of others. Um, so we're going to do part two next week, and today we're just going to talk about um, dating and disability, and Priya so graciously offered to host. <laughs> Thank you I, so much. I can't, I've been in a relationship for 30 years. Like, I don't know anything about dating. So. But you're well, like, you know, and I, I, what I thought was that, Priya, because you've been in a, such a long-term relationship, pre and post disability. And I'd love for you to share your experience. You know, you like you're almost an expert because it's lasted so long pre and post. So why don't we just go ahead and start there. I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to ask it for anyone um, because I am recording this not on my computer. It's going to be recorded as speaker view, not as gallery view. It's so I'm going to think that if as we're recording i'm going to ask that we put ourselves on mute if we're not talking if you're on a computer that would be the space bar to mute and unmute yourself um if you're on a device i think at the at the bottom left there's a mute button and um if you're on the phone if you're calling in it's star six okay so i'm gonna put myself on mute and i'm gonna allow um Priya to go ahead and take over. And if you want to just start out with your experience with relationships, that would be awesome. Okay. Well, okay. So yeah, I'm Priya. I had a spinal cord injury in 1999. So that's like 21 years that I've lived as a person with a disability. And Robert, my partner, we, we met, like we were like, these fortunate people we just kind of met at a really early, like in our early twenties. And we just became, we just clicked right away and we just went off in our world and 
people would always be like, how long have you guys been together? And we're like, oh, uh, I don't know. Like we just didn't, it was like a question we did. We were just like, oh, what year did we, what year was it we met? I can't remember. And so it was just like, that's just the way it worked out for us. And um, then I had my injury and Robert, you know, you know, loved me and just decided he wanted to stay. And, and then we figured out how to manage that, like, you know, manage our, we're also in a band together. So, you know, we, and before my injury, we toured a lot, we booked shows a lot. So we're very active. So it was really weird after our in, my injury, we both kind of got airlifted out of this like really active life with lots of people around us to living in my parents' basement, which was great. My parents were actually really great people and were very supportive. So, you know, when I say parents, but I don't know, it always sounds bad, but like I'm living in my parents' basement. <laughs> so it wasn't really a bad, it was great. Like I, I actually enjoyed that time because it, gave me time to actually, which is another subject we might talk about is relationship with your family when you have a disability. So it was, it was great for me because, you know, being from Indian culture and choosing the path of life I did, which was like becoming an artist and musician wasn't really accepted by my family. So it was really great because I don't know, I feel like I got to like, come to full circle with my parents as far as the relationship with them. And, but, you know, they were very supportive to me and Robert to help us figure out how to live the life, this new life we had. So then we did that. And then, I don't know, we decided to move to California and we, we moved to LA first and then we moved to the Bay area and, you know, we just did our band and, so how it changed our relationship then as far as that goes but i th i don't know i don't know if it changed because robert also i will say has you know pretty i wouldn't say bad add but definitely add where it's like i have to remind him and be like i kind of have to almost manage his mental issues as he has to help me manage my physical issues. So I always tell people we're, we're perfect. We're like, like a physically, he's got mental problems. I got physical problems. We just work it out. So, um, yeah. So then we kind of went through that. And so like, as far as the band goes, like when we started doing the band again, the world of course is inaccessible as we all know especially if you use a wheelchair it's, it's i don't know maybe not i mean i don't use a cane and stuff but maybe it's just as inaccessible for people like that but yeah you know when you live in a wheelchair and you're all of a sudden you're like oh i can't get in here or the door's too narrow or um is that renee i can't see is that right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's like the door's too narrow or, oh, there's a step here or, you know, these, all these different things. So Robert was always with me to be able to, like, cause I was in a manual chair at first. And so he would always pull me in and do things. So that, you know, that was like a change in our relationship, but I don't know, Robert just didn't see, he didn't care. It well, didn't bother him. It doesn't bother him to do things for me. Um, you know, it almost is like, I feel guilty. Like I feel guilty to have to ask Robert to do things for me or have to. So it's like almost really my problem. Like Robert doesn't have a problem with it, but I, I'm like, uh, I do everything in my power not to ask him for as little help as possible. And you know, and he's always like, I don't mind. You don't, and I'm like, I know you don't mind, but I mind. <laughs> like, I don't want to ask you, so be quiet. <laughs> so then I get snippy because he's like, I don't care if you're not. I was like, I know you don't care, but I care. And I don't want you to do it for me. So just be quiet. So it's like stuff like that happens. And then with him, he, you know, he's always like, because of his ADD, he, like today, I will tell you, I was telling him, like I was, we, I don't know, we were discussing the definition of a word and he literally listened to the first two words of my sentence and the last two words of my sentence. And then 
concluded what I was saying and then looked it up on Wikipedia to tell me how I was wrong. And I was like, that was exactly what I said to you, but you only listened to the first two words of my sentence and the last two words of my sentence. So now you don't understand. Now you just went and looked it up on Wikipedia to tell me, you know, to be like, no, Priya, this is, you don't know what you're saying. Let me, I found it on Wikipedia. Let me read it to you. And I got really irritated by that because I was like, I said, that's what I said. You just didn't listen. And then you went on Wikipedia to tell me how I was wrong. So I was like, but you know, you know, it's just like, I just feel like when you're in a relationship, we've been together for, I, I think like 33 years now, something like that. So like I told you, I, we don't, Robert and I've never been able to keep track of how long we've been together, but we figured it out because of our age. We're like, oh, it must be like 30 something years. So we do, I, I'm going to say around 33 years. So when you're in a relationship that long, and I actually told Tylea yesterday because she was like upset about something and she wasn't really mad at John just like some weird social thing had happened and she kind of called to vent to me about it I was like well you know you gotta pick and choose what you want to argue about <laughs> it's like, is it really important to get into an argument about the definition of a word or because someone didn't wash their cup or you know the, just these things that happen when you live with a person so you know, that, and then I will shift to like my perspective of dating from all my friends that are single, not disabled and non-disabled, they all seem to complain about the same things. Like that, you know, it's awkward and people write mean things, whether, it, and then like with the disabled community, people from the disabled community, it seems like the dating app, the dating app thing just, I, that is like a world that I know nothing about. And I'm so glad I don't have to know about it because it seems awful, awful, awful. And um, some of the disabled people have told me, like, I've heard experiences of people like, you know, when they find out they're disabled, then they're like, you know, ask questions like, does your vagina work? Like, just like weird things, like, that they can't be like, I don't, know. I don't know why people can't just be more like, you know, ask in a more sensitive way. <laughs> like, like, oh, so, you know, can you have sex? How does that work? Not like, does your vagina work? <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's like, it's kind of an insensitive way to put it, in my opinion. And, you know, for men, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if a lot of women would be like, does your penis work? Does your, or, you know, the more, I'm not going to say the D word, but you know, whatever. <laughs> work. Like, you know. So anyway, so, you know, so what I find is like the struggle of dating in general is like a struggle for everyone, whether you're disabled or non-disabled, I think it's just this social construct that has existed since, I don't know if it's the beginning of time, but for a really long time. And when I was younger, we didn't have the internet and apps. So it was like bars and then you have the single bars. So I feel like apps are kind of almost like the single bars like that existed in the seventies. And now, um, Oh, Paul, it's happened to you too. I know it's happened. I mean, I feel fortunate because I met when I was younger, you know, like when, like, you know, when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, of course I tried to date people and it was all like, it didn't work. And I don't know, just when I met Robert, it was really great. And it wasn't even like thinking about how do I impress them? It's, we just really work, our chemistry worked together really well. So we were really lucky, but you know, I, you know, I do remember my experiences from when I was really young and it, it being awkward and in the 70s and maybe the 80s there were like single bars. And then in the 90s, I don't know the single bar thing, but it was just like people just went to bars to meet each other. It wasn't really framed as a single bar. And I don't know, like, and for me, like in, in my 20s, it was, 
you just went to, uh, you know, like I'm in a band, so going to see a band was kind of like this, another area where people are there to see a band, maybe they, and then the one cool thing about my band is a lot of people have come up to me and Robert and were like, I met my husband at your concert. I, we went to go see your band and we met there and got married. And so like Robert and I are like, oh, that's so nice. That's so nice. These people like met at, a, at our show and like, because they liked our band and that was the common thing and that's how they met. So that, you know, so I think in the nineties it was more like, activities if you went to activities like shows or concerts and these things it's, it was how you were meeting other people so can i can yeah. i ask um real quick so paul um just to clarify in terms of what happened to you someone asked you if your penis worked what? now i'll give you time to talk as a chat put in the chat um <laughs> or if you want to unmute yourself and have your brother t um, help you, but um, I just, go ahead, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, oh, yeah, women are just as insensitive as men, <laughs> obviously. Well, and I think it's, I think it's interesting to see that when we think of relationships, our, uh, my, our minds, like, I don't know if we've been programmed this way, or if it's just human nature, equates sex and intimacy with relationships. You know, and I think the distinction you made, Priya, about pre-dating apps in the technology world, people would meet over shared and common interests, right? So if they met at a concert, that's something that they both enjoyed, enjoyed doing. If they met at a pottery class, they both enjoyed pottery class. So there was already a commonality that bonded them beyond just looking for a quote unquote relationship or intimacy in that way. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. And um, the, 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 I, I, yeah, that was, I'm glad you framed it that way. Cause I was, you know, I was trying to think of that, you know, I was thinking of it as I'm going along, but yeah. So I think the app world, like I, I discussed this with like my friends, non-disabled and disabled people. It's like the app world, is just there because you're going there to find someone and there and you know people can write their interests and people put fake pictures of themselves to make themselves yeah. like younger cuter better or hotter whatever to draw these people in you don't have a common bond then yeah then it's that right so right I and Renee, Renee thanks for coming and joining our conversation because you also, and, and so wait, I want to get a show of hands. Who, um, and if you want to put it in the chat, type a one if you're single and type a two if you're in a marriage or long-term relationship. Two. Oh, yeah, two. Oh. It's so much harder on the. Oh, well, if you have trouble typing, just, just say it. I I I don't, but I okay. Paul says one forever. Yep. One is single. Two is wait. One single. Two is in a relationship. Okay. Okay. One. So we got, and I I didn't see anything from Denise, but I I believe she's married. Me? Denise, no, I'm sorry, Denise, not Denise, Renee. Renee. You think I'm married? <laughs> I'm having technical dis difficulties, so I'm, I'm going on to my other computer. So, okay. that, but yes, I'm married. <laughs> okay. yeah, no well, no, I've seen your husband walking in the back of the desk. <laughs> you saw my husband? How I? Oh, 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 boy, not her husband. I saw him in the background walking around. So. But maybe, maybe it's not her husband. Maybe it's her, like, cool <laughs> boy or servant boy. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, he'll love that. <laughs> I love this in this quarantine moment. We're in this quarantine moment, so I just assumed it wasn't another, just some random person. <laughs> but, yeah, so I just, um, 
yeah, so that's like my experience relationships. I've been in a long-term relationship and I actually just wrote this piece for the mighty. I just finished it kind of talking about having to depend on your friends and family for caregiving and you know, these things that you wish you just had, a, you know, I mean, and I talk about in the piece how I wish I could just pay a caregiver to come because, you know, Robert has insomnia. He has, you know, that's another part of his mental makeup. So he can't sleep. And, you know, I feel bad to wake him because I have to wake up really early to be able to get ready by 11 or 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I have to be essentially get up at five. So, you know, I don't know when he went to sleep. So it's like, to me, I feel that's like, and I don't know if it bothers him as much, but it bothers me a lot that I have to like, I'm not sure if he slept. Then I have to wake him up and be like, are you up? Can you get me this hot water bottle and this stuff? And so that's really like the main thing for me that bothers me as far as the dynamic of our relationship, but it doesn't, and you know, it does bother him when he has to get up and he hasn't slept. He just went to sleep like a five minutes ago. So, you know, so it does bother him, but you know, he, he just sucks it up and deals with it basically. Yeah. So I feel like as, as people who are in long-term relationships and it's so interesting because coming into my relationship, I was already disabled, so it wasn't something that happened to us. Okay, we got Ernie coming back. Um, sorry, you guys have to see such a close-up of my face when I have to touch it. I mean, to let something in on my phone. Okay, your face is beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank you, Al. You're too kind. Um, but, you know, and, and, and so for, our, for my experience, my relationship, the disability was already there and so it was something he could say yes or no to um, right. from the beginning i'm curious from the single <laughs> bull uh here if um sorry i just want to make sure renee but I, uh I, i'm curious from the single people here what has if you could narrow it down to one obstacle you think you have in dating i know paul you put one forever i don't know if that's by choice like you want to be single by choice or no okay so it just feels like it's been forever but you're not dead yet so 56 is like the new 30. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah if you guys um if denise or paul you guys are the single ones here I, i'd be interested in seeing uh what your what your, your thoughts are in terms of your experiences and maybe let maybe let's bring it down a little bit have either of you been in a relationship or dated i've dated before um i've been in a relationship before and that um i'm glad that ended because the guy was um um he wasn't my type so yeah but um with that being said um i have um done the the dating um app thing and it seems to me like whenever i tell people I have a disability, they like back away. So I'm not really eager to, um, you know, tell people anymore, <laughs> I guess. Cause I feel like, I mean, I feel like I should hide it as much as I can, you know, which is not always smart because you know, people aren't dumb. <laughs> They could probably figure it out, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, so um, I just get that I can't be who I am, you know, with the dating app. So I guess that's whenever you meet someone, you know, you have to 
be yourself, you know, but that's because I've had that before where, um, where I'd say like, I, you know, I had meningitis and they're like, oh, that's cool. But then I've never, I never hear from them again. <laughs> so. So the relationship that you had, was that from a dating app or from something else? No, I, I met him at school. I met him on, um, co in college. So, yeah. So look, said the same thing. Paul had a, an experience, a two week puppy love fling from college. Is that correct? Paul? Okay. I don't, I don't want to misinterpret. Um, so what do you guys feel? Do you feel like your disability is your number one obstacle in Indeed. Sometimes, sometimes I do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute, Priya. Trying to mute it. So. Paul, what, how about your experience? Do you think your disability is your biggest obstacle? Speech. Your speech. Yeah. understand that. Um, yeah, so this is the thing, right? So the dating world, I, I also just feel the media and not even the media, I mean, like books, like, you know, fairy tales and stuff have always been like Snow White. It's always like she ate a poisoned apple and the handsome prince came and kissed her and they married and lived life out, you know, so this this narrative that we've just been given for I, forever is like, you're going to meet this perfect, beautiful person. That's exact. That's like this, this, and this. And then, you know, when uh, that's looking for essentially back, even if they aren't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I just saw that movie yesterday. Do you have something to say, Paul? I'm sorry. Hey. I talked about Paul, so interject. Oh, sorry. Don't interrupt me. Okay. Baby. No, you know why? He's back sorry. when he was a kid in the 70s. Yes. Please. He was pretty what, Chabu? He didn't. <laughs> he felt like it was kind of taboo in, when he was younger for someone like him to date. I, <laughs> you were told what? <laughs> He was told pretty awful stuff by who? <laughs> by teenage girls. So I guess he had some bad um, experiences. He didn't pursue that again after those initial um, bad experiences from certain girls. I guess they didn't. Uh, weren't nice to him, I guess, so, or didn't react nicely, so, yeah, yeah, and, and the thing is, I just want to explain something, Paul can talk much clearer, but when he gets um, tense or stressed, it, it gets tougher and tougher, you know, so if you get Paul on a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and he's comfortable with you, you'll see, I will Oh, okay. So I make sure Paul wants to share with you guys that he wrote this book. Anyway, it's called Redefining Normal. It may be backward, I don't know. Anyways, and what it's about is about his experiences, um, you know, growing up in school. This starts from when he was um, going through school. He has, has uh, like, his experiences with, you know, What's that? 
Breaking in. Oh, going to the school system. I went to regular schools. It's, it was, he's um, had to um, transition into the regular schools and his struggles with that and the barriers of uh, doing that. And so, I did go into nightclubs. He tried going to nightclubs in the 80s with a friend of his. I would really go to do it. He'd wait for the girls to get drunk. He did a cake. Then he would like get to dancing and he'd, you know, get some dances accomplished and stuff. But that was it as far as, you know, getting, you know, close to the ladies, I guess. <laughs> so. Cool. <laughs> That's your sad story. That sounds like a good part of the story. Oh, he says, says his sad story. <laughs> you were the hippie trying to go to clubs and meeting with him. Yeah. Had some fun, but. <laughs> Nice. So, um, um, it's no, oh, sorry. Did, do you want to say something, Priya? Yeah, go ahead. Um, have you heard of Alette Koble Temple? She was Miss Wheelchair California, and then she actually took the crown for the whole um, USA. So she's wheelchair Miss Wheelchair USA, oh. I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. And she and I had a lot of parallels, but she had CP and has quite a speech impediment and she had to tour the country making speeches and she's she's a psychology press professor at um at uh, jfk university in the north northern california mm -hmm. and she came to hawaii and we arranged for her to do some speaking events here and it was funny because she would say you know it's not my issue it's your issue you can't understand a cp accent and so <laughs> Yes, yeah, an yeah. <laughs> but we had um, a gentleman on the island. He passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. But his name was Giel, G I L L E Legacy, <gasps> and he was an artist. And he married a beautiful woman, and uh, you know she is, you know, to this day makes Facebook posts about. Um, her love with him and and so you know i i just feel like it's evidence that even though you may feel that your speech is hindering your ability to date and I'm, i you know and i'm not gonna lie it maybe it probably is i feel like not having arms and legs hindered my ability to date um but that there is hope that there are people out there that are willing to um see below the the stuff and I you know having people like Priya and Renee who became disabled during their relationships and the guys uh, the divorce rate among people who are married and then have a disability happen to them it's so high that the fact that your husbands and, and partners stuck around is you know that's a big deal because they didn't have to and so I just feel like that there are good people who are willing to look beyond the physical in terms of a relationship. Oh, can I, is it cool if I say? Yeah, so I, I'm just gonna tell you, like when I had my injury, my parents did not like Robert at all because he was like, I don't, I don't know if I've actually seen Robert, but he's got long, crazy hair and glasses. He's just a wild looking guy. And when he was younger, even wilder. Um, and so my parents were like, what is she doing? And they just, before my injury, they never, we, because we were together for probably about 10 years before I had my injury and um, they just never got to know him. And then when I had my injury and it was obvious to my parents that Robert was not going to leave, that was like when my parents were like, oh, he's a <laughs> They like my dad, like I remember after I had my injuries the first time I went in the car and I was driving with him, he's like, 
you know that Robert's a very good guy. And I was like, uh-huh. yeah, I've been with the guy for 10 years. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> a guy that wasn't but I just thought it was even then even yeah I was just newly disabled so I was like processing other things so when I, yeah hello <laughs> it's like face me of course I picked a good guy so but then you know Robert actually became part of our my in you know Robert was raised by a single mom so he didn't really have a lot of a family and you know, for Robert, my family became his family. So it was like a really interesting social thing because like then after that, all my Indian family would be like, yeah, you know, a lot of men wouldn't stick around. Like if it was an Indian man, he might have just been like, I don't want to deal with this. I'm just going to go find another wife or, you know, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So that happened. And to Paul's situation... I also have seen, not people I know, but just seen like couples just on social media where someone does have a, you know, speech, different speech pattern and ability. And they're with a a non-disabled person that, I don't know, like if beauty is like even a mat- case in this matter, but a person that's what they're with and they're happy. And so and to be honest, when I met Robert, like Robert was like the weird of the, he's really eccentric. He was weird. He wasn't exactly like a good looking guy. I just liked him because he was so smart and funny. And, you know, <laughs> friends are like, oh my God, Robert's got a girlfriend and she's hot. And I'd be like, I'm hot. All right. That's the first time anyone's ever said <laughs> about me. <Yeah>. Like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I just, I, you know, it was a real eye opener to what Robert's friends are like. And I, I even told Robert, I was like, your friends are really crappy. They like, you you know, you met a girl, you're happy. And they're like, I'm almost trying to sabotage it for him because he was like the weirdo that they like to make because he, you know, had mental issues. And so he was really crazy and weird. And um, I don't even like to use the weird, weird. He was eccentric. You know, he just was always coming up with strange ideas and, you know, being this like eccentric person. So, so even in that situation, people were shocked that I liked Robert and I wanted to be with him. And, you know, after, uh, after being with him for like, you know, about six months, I was like, your friends are really horrible. (laughs) Like, well, I can't believe they're not happy for you. Instead, they're like, I can't believe you got this girl to go out with you type of and that was the that was like the sentiment back then of all his friends and so yeah you know that kind of stuff happens but in the end you know people get to know people and and unfortunately it takes a lot of work because people for the most part are superficial in my opinion I think people get really superficial but you know if you keep going out there and meeting people you're gonna meet someone that do you have a special connection with and they have a special connection? <coughs> what do you mean by superficial? Superficial meaning, for instance, with Paul, he has a different speech pattern. So because of that, someone might not even... <clears throat> we make these preconceived notions about what a person with like a speech pattern is or if they have said, or even if you see someone with cerebral palsy and they can speak really well, but they have a lot of spasms in their body, I think people automatically jump to the conclusion that that person is not smart for some reason or cannot, you know, can't keep up. And they don't, and that's like what my goal is, is my, with my grassroots group is to like break these stereotypes that we have of people with disabilities like because Paul does have a different speech pattern and people automatically make this assumption that maybe he's not smart maybe he can't do this maybe he can't do that you know and they make these assumptions instead of actually getting to know the person so that's and if for you too like people are like oh you have meningitis never mind because what does that mean What does that mean? They don't probably don't even know what that is. You know? Yeah. 
So like to be like, oh, you have meningitis? Forget it. I, I don't want to deal with that. Well, what do you what do? You, you don't even know what you're dealing with, really. In my opinion. Well, uh, how can you, um, yeah, and how, how can you know someone on the first time with them? Yeah. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's the thing. We make these decisions of who we're going to get to know by these. And later you know, I'm going to go back to the narratives. We've been given like Snow White, Cinderella, like all these fairy tales of meeting the prince and the beautiful prince that's like 100% perfect. I mean, that doesn't exist really in the world and i mean even if someone's like the most beautiful person in the world they i find they most they have something else wrong with them if they they're like <laughs> look at they've got something yeah ed that you're like that's bonkers i, I don't know if i want to hang out with you and i actually don't like beautiful people i, I always think beautiful people probably have a problem and i don't want to get to <laughs> That's uh, if they're rich and beautiful, they're really messed up. <laughs> yeah, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. If someone's like really like beautiful, I'm like, there's something wrong with that person. <laughs> they have to prove to me that there's something that they're okay. So that's like uh, so Priya, Priya, are we uh, are we ugly just and uh, just ugly enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> there's just a enough for me to like them. Exactly. That's a great reframing. <laughs> That's not a really nice compliment. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just like, like when I was in high school, I wasn't popular in high school. I wasn't disabled, but I was Indian. I moved a lot. My parents did not, were not into buying designer clothes. They just didn't understand that. So they just bought me whatever, you know, the cheapest clothes, you know, clothes because they were cheap. So yeah, so I was always an outsider and uh, dating like that didn't, you know, and the dating was weird for me because I come from an Indian family anyway. So then it was like, I didn't even know how to navigate that world. And um, is Robert Indian? No, Robert's a Brooklyn. Oh, just Robert's a oh, he's Jewish from Brooklyn. That's like oh, okay. Does he have an accent? No, Robert actually had an accent. Like he tapes for me when he was a kid, so he had that like really heavy Brooklyn, New York accent. But his friend, he was friends with. Uh, he was friends with this black gay guy Willie in his teenage years. And Willie like told him, you need to get rid of that accent because people are going to think you're not smart because of that accent. That's so, not right. true. I'm I know. But you know that's, that's so offensive. Oh, that, I don't I mean, mean you. I'm just saying. That's just wrong. People were so offensive in the 80s. We know that the 80s, people were not politically correct. <laughs> 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 so, that was like what they said to him. So Robert would like tape his voice listen to it and he changed his accent like he's he's really well spoken no one would even realize he's from new york he has this like very he has this radio like a kind of a radio announcer type voice really well spoken so yeah it's but that was robert's you know because robert like so there's like another instance where the superficiality comes around because his friend because we do make, we do, you know, we're talking about the CP accent, but we even, if you have a Southern accent or you have a New York or Boston accent, we make these preconceived judgments on people when they talk like, you know, when they speak like that. So, yeah. So like, while I do think it's more, it's worse for people with disabilities because I do think you can always meet another New Yorker with the same accent as you or something because you live in New York. But yeah, it's harder to meet people with CP or, or people that just have an understanding, you know, can look beyond that first, the, the first impression. Well, and you Paul know, in the chat, Paul put in the chat that he used to have hair, so. 
Uh, oh. Yeah, maybe it's the hair, Paul, not the, <laughs> not your CP accent. It's not your CP accent, it's the hair, but it isn't. I think you're actually a very handsome fella, in my opinion, so. Oh, yes, you are. Don't. You are. And you I have this smile. You can, I can already tell you're just a sweet, nice person. And there's lots of bald, bald <laughs> celebrities, like David Cross and all these people, like, they're bald. Your brother's balder than you, so I mean, <laughs> <than you. laughs> well, and you know what though? I think that also impacts our dating, right? Like, how do we do we embrace? Can we embrace ourselves? Um, and in my experience, I can only speak from my experience. I'm not an expert in any way, um, but the more I came into as an adult and started embracing all of me and accepting all of me, that's when other people were able to do that as well. They were able, cause I believe that we're just reflections of one another. Like, so what people see in me, is what I'm already projecting. So they accepted me because I fully accepted me. But when I was younger and like, not sure, and that's normal for every young person. Right. Um, and, but, of course, if they're already naturally beautiful, they have that already going for them, even if they're not confident. But I do feel like there is this parallel between knowing our own like beauty so that other people can recognize that beauty in us too. And I just want to share that uh, a couple things, but Priya, to your the narrative that we're fed uh, from Disney from early on, right, of like this... The, every princess and prince is good looking. I took my seven year old cousin, I'm 13 years older than her. So I was already older and I took her to the movies and we went to go see the hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> and after this movie, I took her to the bathroom and she was crying. And I'm like, what, what's wrong? And she said, I don't understand why, I guess it was Isabella, like the, the, the girl picked the pants and prince. He didn't do anything. It was the hunchback of Notre Dame that did everything. He was the hero, but just because he doesn't look good looking, she didn't pick him and it hurt her to the core. And she was seven years old. And I really feel oh. that she was able to see that, to make that leap, not only because she was just a, an amazing child, but because of the influence I had in her life that it's not always about the looks that make the person. Mm -hmm. yeah of disability in her life already I, wow. and you know i was raised by a disabled mother so maybe because i was always like that when i was a kid when i would watch those disney movies i'd like oh like i hate it i mean i was like when i was a kid i was like i hate snow white and the seven drawers blah 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 blah, blah. like i didn't like those stories because i just i didn't like this idea well, that it was what, a, what about cinderella she was the kind of kind of the like the outcast of the stepsisters. I mean, she was beautiful in comparison she, to. She's the princess, but she like the stepsisters didn't didn't treat her like princess, you know. Well, yeah, no, and that's interesting, Denise, because actually in Cinderella, the stepsisters who got all the stuff were actually not the beautiful ones it was actually cinderella that was the beautiful one yeah but they made them ugly on purpose i think well yeah of course that, that's the story is like yeah <laughs> like beauty it, is within i right. think yeah but not not in the stepsister not cinderella's stepsisters the <laughs> outside and inside yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at, I wish Tylee was here because she's the Disney fan. I did, I did, I oh, like, I love Disney. I watched, I watched <laughs> Snow White yesterday, actually, with my dad. <laughs> well, and you know, Snow White, I'm like, why didn't she pick one of the dwarves? They were so nice and caring for her. All the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's what our... We need to she's just overlooked them. That's horrible. Okay. But, but you know, they're fighting probably because all of them liked her. Here's an idea. You know how Once Upon, that show Once Upon a Time, 
They would take fairy tales and twist it and spin it. We should do that Ooh, with all I the fairy love tales. It. We should do I that. I love with that the show. I or what is Snow White's like? I don't care about this prince. I like this this dwarf. He's so nice to me. Or little person. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, we should take like, all the fairy tales and spin it on its head and be like. Well, this is what an, an inclusive world would look like, right? Do a zine on that, Priya. <laughs> I wish I could animate and just make a cartoon, but I can't do that. But I can make a zine about it, so I'll do that. But and even Beauty and the Beast, right? She already fell in love with the Beast aspect of him, but it wasn't right. good <laughs> in, our, in the social contra construct. We had to make him good looking and be a prince behind right. the Beast in order yeah. for Accept it. Right, right, totally. Whereas then we would, the story would be the beast turn. stays the beast and never turns into the prince and beauty is yeah, with the beast. Gaston was like the um villain in that movie, I think. Who yes, was the villain? Gaston. I can't remember. I saw those movies Gaston, so long. Gaston. Gaston. Oh, Gaston was the prince. Gaston. He was oh. the one that wanted her first. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't have a really great memory. Stop and I'll concede and one is a Yep. You're breaking up, Denise. Yeah, Denise, yeah. you're breaking up. I can't hear you totally there. What? But, oh, so, I'm sorry. So the, the narratives are just, you know, I think those narratives, like, I don't know, I think kids, for the most part, aren't really judgmental like that, maybe, and, like, maybe seeing things like that is what kind of puts these things in their minds, in a way. I don't know. Yeah. Paul, want to say something? You're going to... You're going to type it? Uh. Hollywood doesn't help, he says. <laughs> When they put out movies, <coughs> like four years ago, what's that? It's called Me Before You. Was the movie. Oh, I saw that movie. That's a good movie. You didn't like it. It's a spirit. <laughs> oh, the message that Paul got from that was that they were saying it would better to be dead than handicapped. That's what he got from that. <laughs> You've seen other movies with the same. Oh, there was the same narrative. He's saying he's seen other movies. They seem to push that theme. It's well, common narrative in, in Hollywood. It's like the disabled person's either the villain or yeah. some you feel bad for or yeah like they got healed and their life is better or they're dead and they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. those they need to be sick to heal yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you know things like that yeah um, um, fyi if you guys are interested i totally binged it in one night stayed up to like two in the morning but netflix has a show called love on the spectrum yeah uh, and so, I don't know if I mentioned that to you guys before, but I thought it was interesting because I don't have autism. I'm not on the spectrum, but just seeing the, perspe the perspective of dating for them, it's only five episodes. So if you're bored one night and you're looking for something, Love on the Spectrum on Netflix is a great Love on the Spectrum? Yeah. It's on Netflix. Yeah, someone else mentioned that to me recently, I think. Well, apparently. They said, you know. 
<clears throat> yeah, apparently the autism, I don't know, someone, because there's this crit camp group on Facebook and people are always, sometimes I'll go right and this woman asks, oh, I'm really enjoying this show, Love on the Spectrum. What are the thoughts? I'm always like, why would you ask? <laughs> but, but anyway, you know, there were autistic people or neurotypicals. And, and then it got into this discussion of what neurodivergent and neurotypicals are. And I don't know. A, but yeah, the autistic community feels like it's ableist. But I just don't understand why. Because for me, I, like Pauline, I don't know however many people know autistic people here. I, I've never met an autistic person. And it was interesting to me because it was like kind of informing me about what what people with you know what's going on with autistic people how they focus in on not that they're selfish but they they just have these interests and they don't have the social skills i guess you could call it where they're like oh i'm talking about myself too much let me be interested in what the other, you know, they don't, that doesn't dawn on them. And it's not because they're not caring people. It's just, it's something that they don't understand. So I personally found it very informative, but the autistic community is really not happy with it. They but like it. Really? Oh, they, don't, they don't like the show. Yeah, they wrote all, like, it was just like, I was reading all the comments. I was like, oh, man, okay. Wow. But I agree with them, but I wasn't going to engage in conversation because I don't have time to, like, sit and write back and forth. So, what, so they, they, wrote a review, they wrote a review on the show or what? No, it's not a review. It's just a woman posted on this crypt chat page, like, you know, I'm watching the show. I'm really enjoying it. What do people think? And a lot of autistic people chimed in and they're like, if you went on autistic Twitter, you will see a, a bunch of people, what they think, what able is, yeah. you know, Such bad reception. So, um, <laughs> she has bad, bad, no, bad reception. I'm sorry. That's okay. So Priya, can I ask based, I don't know if you took the time to read any of the comments, but do you know what the primary um, resistance or, or, or upset was? I think that it was kind of more about, because it was a reality TV show and it was being framed, you know, in that Holly, but it was actually, I think it's an Australian show. I don't think it's an American show. And, um, they just were, they were just like saying, like criticizing, like because some of the parent, you know, the parents were always involved in the conversation because the parents, you know, they want to get their kids out there to meet other people and have, you know, as a whatever, whatever the word normal is, but you know, like a, you know, a fulfill full life with a partner or whatnot, and so the parents were so like. They had, and they would have like the coach would come meet with the parents, and the parents would kind of help bridge this like communication gap. And a lot of people hated the coach, thought she was awful, and because she's like teaching them how to be fit into the world of people that weren't autistic. Or something like that. I, I didn't under I didn't quite understand why they were upset because I'm not autistic and sure like maybe if I was I'd understand what they were talking about, but since I'm not, I was just like, okay, they're angry about it. But I enjoyed but the show. That's the interesting mm -hmm. thing. I feel like whenever there's a portray show, their character well. I don't think they um hmm. I think people always get upset about <sighs> right, you know? right. Yeah. There's it's, always there's always critics out there. Always critics and you know now because we are in the social media world, everyone's a critic, right? And <laughs> that's a very New York phrase, by the way, Priya. You can tell your Brooklyn partner. And it's what? nothing everybody in New York goes, Yeah, everybody's a critic. Everybody's a critic. <laughs> yeah, 
Adam has the New York things. He, he <laughs> doesn't do it with the accent. He's all like, hmm, whatever. Everyone's a critic. What? But he's he, a critic. When he gets mad, does he go into his New York accent? My husband says it's what happens to me. No, it doesn't. No? But he'll say some words. There's some words like he can't say drawer. Like he right. has the. Oh, that's say, one. Yeah, yeah. So he'll say, you know, however, I can't do the or, word. Or Mira. Yeah. Mir yeah, or, or Mira. Or or word <laughs> that will come out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like, I don't know. There was this like uh, reality show. I didn't watch it, but it was like called. It was about women in wheelchair. I think they called it Push Girls or something like that. But I, I just, I just saw the commercial. What? It was called Push Girls or something. It was I, a commercial. No, Denise. Was, Push Push Girls is that was a two season reality show series about four women in wheelchairs in L.A. So I don't know. Why? Like Paul, they were like, gorgeous, right? They were like, yeah, oh, that's what right. I didn't like. Push you know, it's like girl. really beautiful and like just like fitting into what the Hollywood image of what a woman should look like. And they were in real terms. So I was just like, I don't look like that. And I actually I have a lot of admiration for a woman that's willing to put the other extra hours of making herself look like that. <laughs> as you well know what? as then their disability on top of it. Me, I'm just like, I mean, I've never been into wearing makeup and fitting into that whole image, but, um, but if I did, I would just give that up because that's like another, that's like another two hours of work. So they, they should just, they should just put them in a show. Don't just put them in like, like, uh, learning about like disabled people, you know, that's not that's like a reality TV show. It is. You know it what I mean? Like reality show. It's a reality show, but it's oh. that you know like, there are people that are in wheelchairs that spend a lot of time doing their makeup and wearing these outfits, yeah. and that's I'm, cool. The right yeah. to do. I just feel like it's a lot of extra work for me. <laughs> I mean, they should they should maybe just get someone that could act and just like throw them like don't make it like. Oh, Denise. But maybe they should do it like. Yeah. I don't well, know. I in, just, in defense of the Push Girls, I, I never was, watched. So. I did. I did. Yeah, that's uh, why I have more insight into that show than I did. So. I didn't watch it, so I have no reference. All right, go ahead, Pauline. Um, I, I'd like. So I guess I shouldn't be talking. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. I never watched there. I just was like thrown off. I didn't like the advertisement for it, so I just didn't even watch it because of that. But go ahead. Pauline, I'd like to hear your opinion of that show because I yeah, uh, yeah. So I, uh, I, I feel like uh, Hollywood is taking baby steps, right? So before there was no reality show with women in wheelchairs. So let's do a reality show about women in wheelchairs who are beautiful, right? There, so that's still socially acceptable. But at least now they're in wheel. At least now there's wheelchairs introduced into reality TV. Um, so yes, I, I totally get like, not everyone is this Hollywood fabulous looking star in a wheelchair. Like not all people, women in wheelchairs look like that. Um, right. and, and, and yay for social media where we get to maybe show our more vulnerable side of, of us. There, um, you know, that's Jesse Stratham who I interviewed um, on there, the chair. Yeah, there, so sorry. It's okay. Um, so if you can like take okay, so I'm gonna ask if we can all take space between people talking. So we're um, not, not over uh, speaking. Over talk. Yeah. So and I do wanna watch the time, we have about fifteen minutes left. But what I was saying was that I feel like um, yeah, so Hollywood is taking, oh, Jessie Stratham. Jessie Stratham, I interviewed her. She's, uh, she was paralyzed 
like early twenties. Um, she has she's for injury, right, Polly? Yeah. yeah so follow her. Uh-huh. Yeah. So she's pretty big on on Facebook. I mean, on social media. But really, her claim to fame was when she fell out of her wheelchair, and she just did a YouTube video on the floor and expressed her frustrations and upset regarding not being able to get pull herself back into her wheelchair. And so I'm so glad that we have the ability now to show our vulnerable side. But in terms of Hollywood, I mean, you look at Push Girls, Little Women of LA, um, like any reality show on mainstream media, there's a certain standard of looks that they apply to everybody, not just people with disabilities. But it's nice to see that they have are taking baby steps. So I feel like, okay, if you're making steps in the right direction, like granted, not all of us look like Angela Rockwood or, you know, <laughs> Tiffany Evans or whoever, you know, but, but not every able-bodied person looks like Angelina Jolie and, you know, and uh, Reese Witherspoon. So, you know, there's standards of beauty all, all the way across, I feel like, but I feel also, um, like in defense of, of them, I would like to see that, that yes, that everyone is a critic and we can all point to like, that's not always realistic, but thank God they're making a, a move in the, that direction because then yeah. it, it did show them dating and all of that. Go ahead, Priya. Yeah, oh, I, I agree with you. I s- thought when I saw the commercials, <laughs> well, at least they're making a show about people in wheelchairs, but I'm still not going to watch it because I, I but, you know, I like, yeah, and I, I, I also, I just don't like Hollywood in general. I, I don't like this like glamour, you know, like the Angelina Jolie's and the Reese Witherspoons. Although I do like their acting, and I, I have seen movies of theirs. But, but you know, I think what actress did? Oh, Shelley, sure, sure, Theron, Sher, what's I don't forget to say. Sharon. Um, Are these Thurman? Thornton. Thurman. Well, great. She did some, she's really beautiful, but I think it's great she did some roles where she, that, you know, made herself beautiful. And that, I love that. I think that was really great. And she's a great actress. So, you in, know, I just, in, their, in their defense, too, they probably could all act better than the Kardashians, yeah. which I don't, I don't know why they have a show in the first place. I don't know. I've never seen that show either. So, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so um, Renee, I know you haven't said a lot in the conversation, but if, if you're willing to share, um, I know you, you have a disability that is, uh, that progressively gets worse. Has that impacted your marriage at all? Oh yeah. Well, I was. I noticed Priya was talking about something that I feel is that I feel like I don't want to ask for things, but Richard's always like willing to help and out. And there's two reasons. One is I don't want to put the burden on him, and the other one is I'm not sure if I'm making myself weaker by constantly asking somebody else to do something, just forcing myself. Then again. With MS, it's so complicated. Then you go, well, is that making more pain? I mean, it's always a question, like all day long, going back and forth. But um, the thing about me and Richard is that Richard is 17 years older than me. When we got married, you know, the whole assumption was, you know, I would be the caregiver sort of later on in life, you know, when he would get older and I'd still be bouncing around. And it's turned out completely the opposite. And so, the one thing that I don't know really healthy people get is that in it, there's no guarantees. Just like, you know, that old phrase, there's no guarantees in life. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know which person is going to get sick first, which person is going to get old first, if someone's going to die first. You know, it's just we go into our lives thinking that it's all planned out. Of course, we get married or we have the babies and when they grow up, they go to college. You know, it doesn't work that way. If people with disabilities know it doesn't work that way. I mean, it, I mean, if you were born with a disability, I'm sure your parents went through it. You know, it, it wasn't supposed to be this way. We weren't supposed to be spending all these hours in the doctor's office, you know, supposed to go to preschool um, or whatever, you know. So just something 
that I noticed the difference. That has nothing to do with me or Richard, really, but it, it kind of does. Um, I thought, see, I got the diagnosis a year into the marriage, okay? And I was like, if you want to just annul this thing and move on, I totally get that. He's like, are you kidding? You know, he's just like one of those people you're talking about. Like, it wouldn't even have crossed his mind. You know, he's just, he's just not like that. So um, I ended up with a gem. Like, I don't know, every day I go, how do I, I don't deserve this. <laughs> I just don't deserve this person. You know, it's just amazing to me. Um, so, yeah. and he it's says a, that, that getting me stuff and doing stuff is keeping him in shape. So, but there you go. Sorry. Yeah, and keep with your conversation, like with my parents, my mom was disabled. She had rheumatoid arthritis, like, pretty much almost right when I was born. Um, and it just progressively got worse. And my dad was like the healthiest person. He oh, never had high blood pressure. He was kind of skinny. He was really always in good shape, but then he got a brain tumor. And he ended oh, up he dying. died first? Did he die yeah, first? He died first. And That's exactly my, what I'm saying. And my family was so shocked because they just, never a bad they just always thought my mom was gonna die first and my dad was gonna look and but it was the opposite so it was like a huge shock to our entire family we were really shell-shocked by the whole thing and so yeah you know and then my mom did live for about three years after my dad died and it was sad sad because my dad was her caregiver and so that was not there for her anymore and and then my Did brother she go into a home at that point. No, no. I mean, fortunately, my brother did live in the same town. So, I mean, it was complicated because they fought all the time. So I was just like constantly, like I would get phone calls from my brother and my mom on conference calls, and I don't know. <laughs> like it was almost like I was in my dad's role because my dad was always the mediator, and so I was just like, I was like, but I'm not my dad. My dad was so much better at this than I was. So I was just like, well, mom, don't you think blah, 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 blah. And then to my brother, don't you think dot, 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 dot. So it was just like a weird moment. Like when my brother gets so frustrated with my mom and my mom's so frustrated with my brother, they get me on conference call. And I'd be like, well, <laughs> so it was just so difficult. And my dad was so good at it. So. It was just, I don't know. I inherited personality, but not as much of it, but some of it. So, so I, I was really able don't, to... I don't like relying on another person, no matter who it is. You know, it's really hard. I don't know how you feel. I don't like it either. I mean, I, I mean, I'm like, I'm like just doing things that I probably shouldn't be doing just because I want to do it by myself. And Robert's like, let me help you. I'm like, no, get away from me. I'm doing this. Even though I'm like, Oh, so much that sounds like word for word what happens around here. I'm, just, I'm almost word for word. Leave me alone. I'm going to do it even though I'm like dying in pain. Yeah, it looks like Paul's in agreement. Did you want to say something to that, Paul? I can say something, Paul, but I can Paul is on mute. Yeah. Oh, there he goes. Yeah, Paul just wants to share that, uh, well, maybe two things. One that um, we had the same situation about 10 years ago when our mom passed away. She was the super healthy one. My dad had had a bad heart for like 20 years and he lasted and you know, kept on going well. But then we found out um, uh, when our, our mom got diagnosed with like a bile duct cancer. And before that she was walking miles, super healthy, doing everything right. And she was gone in like six weeks. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so then at that time, I moved in with Paul um, and to help out. And our dad was still alive. But then our dad passed away about three months later. And so then um, our sister moved in with us about a year after that. So that what you were saying about we expected our dad to be gone long before our mom. And then our mom was gone, like out of the blue. It was like, a, you know, a total shock. Yeah. Just and, like you know, I thought about Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I just want to continue on to the point. The second point was that as far as doing things for yourself, I am, uh, 
a very helpful person, right? So I, I always want to help Paul all the time. Do this for him, do that for him. You know? So he, I have to make myself not do things because otherwise, because Paul can do a lot for himself. You know, so, you know, you don't, you know, he's very capable to do a lot of things. You know, and hey, hey, yeah. I got to, she's got to stop me from helping him sometimes. I say, you need help? No. You know, I have to ask. I'm always jumping, you know, jumping up and stuff. So he's got to tell me, relax sometimes. And, you know, he can do a lot. And uh, he needs to do those things because I know that if I'm doing everything for him, he's not going to get that movement. He's not going to get that exercise. He's not going to, you know, he needs that movement. And the less he gets, the more stiff he gets. He needs to move. So. At his age, he needs to keep moving. I'm, you know, I believe that too. We all have to keep moving all the time, you know. So, anyways. Yeah, uh, the definition of MS is it's the disease that stops people from moving. Hmm? I'm starting, I feel it every day a little bit more. It just, it just, you don't want to move. You just want to, like, be a statue. Yeah. I don't you know, think I, the only, I mean, I feel like the spinal injury, like my, you know, we talked about how we have similar problems with this, but I think cerebral, I have friends with cerebral, Pylea is like a really good friend of mine. So I, 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 I'm starting, you know, just, I, you know, meeting this crypt chat, I've actually started to meet people with different disabilities than mine and kind of realizing we all have similar problems where our bodies are tightening and, and we have to force ourselves to move. And actually when I had my spinal cord injury, I did my rehab at Shepherd. And one of the things they talked to us about is like, Hey, you know, at first your family or whoever's there, they're going to really be helping you a lot. But at a certain point, you're going to have your independence and you're going to have to learn how to say no to your whoever's there. So it, it's good to say no, it's not a bad thing, but, but you know, it's this give and take thing. And you know, like, my question, oh, sorry. We're still working on it. Like you said, it has to be a balance, you know. Yeah. Balance, you know. And you well, have to and work I, that balance. It's not, it doesn't come easy. I have a question about, how do you know if the other person is just saying they're not bothered or if they're secretly harboring some resentment? I'm always worried about that. Well, that Robert is a New York Jew and he is blatantly honest. So that's why cool. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that and his blatant honesty pisses me off sometimes. I'm like, why do you have to say that? Can't you just be nicer? <laughs> so that's why I know it's not a hidden resentment <laughs> with him. But not everyone's like that. So you, I mean, I don't know. I don't know your husband. Well, I, I feel like um, I feel like there's a couple topics that we could delve into for future crypt chats. And one is how do we navigate caregiving in a intimate relationship? Because that's something my husband and I have had to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, and the other topic is this whole idea of receiving. And so, you know, like people in our position with disabilities, we have to learn how to be good and gracious receivers and at the same time know when we need the dig to hold on to the dignity of being able to be independent, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this dichotomy um, that I think would be a really cool co topic of conversation for a future Crip Chat, since we are coming up on a two, two minutes for our time to end together. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, is that something you guys would love to talk about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. those are yeah. all great. Definitely. I mean, it all came out of this conversation. We're like, oh, maybe that's something we can explore later. But yeah, um, I like I was like thinking, okay, this conversation moved away from relationships, but which is fine because this is part of being in a relationship with people is how do you, how a disability changes a dynamic of relationship. Actually. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's all about relationships, right? There's like a Harvard study done. Um, it's the oldest uh, study being done on happiness. Um, and it was through Harvard. It's been, it's been going on since the early 1900s. Hmm. And they say all across the board, 
the key to happiness is relationships. Mm. And so, um, and, and it doesn't have to be defined by a partner relationship. It could be our relationships with friends, our siblings, our parents, our, you know, and it just goes forward. But, um, I, you know, I, and there's still so much more to talk about. I did do a show on chair chats. It's on YouTube. For those of you who don't know, I do a show on chair on YouTube called chair chats. I, I call it the lifestyle talk show with a disability twist, but, um, I did it's, a show on, so, um, I'm just going to say over talking you. It's good. Watch it guys. I watch it. I haven't seen the last two, but I'm going to, I'm like, I got, <coughs> but her show's good. Continue. <laughs> Thank you for that, for that plug. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I did a show, I think it was aired in sometime in December, so you'd have to go back, but it was with a relationship expert. Her, her name is leaving me right now, but you can find her under the handle under Instagram called Radiant Abilities and she has CP and she talks about, she married someone who's able-bodied. Um, she's a psychologist and she actually, uh, works with people with disabilities in the dating world. Um, so she is an expert, um, if you're interested in delving further um, mm -hmm. about it, but she talks about how um, her, her husband-to-be, as they were dating, was like, I don't know if I could do this. Like, I like you, but I don't know if I could do this because you have a disability. And there are so many dynamics, right, that we have not even <clears throat> yet about how, like, I, my husband's able-bodied. Um, Priya, Renee, you are all in relationships with someone who's able-bodied. Like, did they get any pressure from their friends dating us or being, staying with us? Um, you know, so that would be an interesting, uh, conversation to have there too, um, about what their experience was. Um, I know I can just tell you right now, my husband is not the person to be in the limelight. So he, I would love, I've asked him, would you come on? <laughs> camera with me and, and have a conversation. He's like, absolutely not. So um, <laughs> I respect his privacy. I can share our story later because like I said, it's different that the disability didn't happen in the middle of our relationship. It was from the beginning, you know, so there's a different dynamic there as well. Um, but it is, it is our, our time to close. I feel like we should have a farewell song. I have, every I have one week. question, but it's not on topic. So maybe can we close and then can I talk to you? How does that work? Yeah, yeah. I would love that, Renee. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, so right now I'm at a resort in Kona at a staycation. And my, oh. my birthday weekend, my husband and son left. Happy oh, birthday. Thank you. Um, so they just arrived here. So um, I literally just walked in the door. I do want to make sure I am a good host to them as well. Um, but yes, Renee, um, could you, we're Facebook friends. If you could message me a good time, we could schedule to talk. Oh, yeah, I was just going to, it's about, the, the, okay, let me just put it this way. Um, I was just curious, maybe Paul can answer the question. I've noticed there's about four or five, six people that are coming regularly. And then we get these people come come in and they visit like once or twice and then they'll come back. And I'm concerned that we're being too uh, maybe it, I don't know. We're not we're not being sensitive to what's happening. Like maybe we're being too friendly with each other. There's sort of an inside group and an outside group, and I don't know. I was just worried about it. I just wish more people would stick around. Okay, so Paul would like to say something. Paul says he's sorry he doesn't buy that. What's that? Oh, you just have to stick your nose in and talk. You have to participate. I think people are just by nature coming and going all the time anyways. I mean, it may have nothing to do with you you are doing or saying they just people are flighty they just come and go and yeah. hopefully when they get in a conversation with you they they go oh i'd like to con have another conversation they come back but you know there's going to be a lot of people just come and go it's just i think it's just human nature i wouldn't really take it personally yeah and then they just have, they have things to do and some people tune in because if someone's hosting their friends kind of show up for them to support them so i think um, uh, and then people get busy yeah. and 
I can't yeah. do it. I know Paul is very grateful that you have these uh, Zoom chat things available because, especially since we're all like locked down now, like it's, you know, we don't have so little opportunities to engage with other people. So, yeah. keep it, you know, I know. Glad you okay. can. I'll stop worrying. Yeah. I'll stop worrying. It's as he gets more comfortable. Glad to meet you, Paul. When he gets yeah, more Paul, I'm so yeah. glad you came. I love you. Yeah. I can't wait to get to know you better. It's, it's going to be awesome. Um, could I ask you a question, Paul? Yeah. Do you know yeah. sign language? <laughs> what was the question? I do the sign language. Oh, <laughs> his hands move a lot, but he's not actually communicating with them. <laughs> well, you have to my leg. Got excited. I saw your hands and I was like, oh, I think Paul has to say something. So that's I can, a, a can, a. He can do A. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, Paul's actually good. I can do that. Mm. Oh. So, well. So, um, so I my, made it on Facebook, Paul, so reach out anytime. Yeah. I love meeting you. Yeah. I love meeting Yeah, cool. I'm yeah. glad I met you. He's very active on Facebook, actually. So, if you connect with him, there, you'll see a lot. You'll see a lot from him and, you know. Okay. I don't, I don't go on it a lot, but you could always message. I use the messenger. People are always messaging me things because I don't go scroll on it. But <laughs> Well, and, and I want to, um, yeah, Paul, you're about to just get inundated with friends. Um, and I would invite you to. <laughs> I don't, know already, um, I don't know if you've already joined our Facebook group. Um, it's called Crypt Chat club via zoom um it's in the email if you signed up through my eweber subscriber list at the bottom is the link to the facebook group if, but it's called uh, it's called crypt chat okay via, crypt chat club via zoom um and so yeah if you want to join us there and we also have like a group chat and facebook messenger going um kriya do you mind adding him no, I'm adding him right. I'm way ahead of you. Woo! Woo! <laughs> awesome. This crypt chat group awesome. right now. Awesome. And then, um, Renee, I want to thank you for bringing that up because I think it's important that we do check ourselves. A lot of us have been here from the beginning. Some of us came in a few weeks in and then have, have really showed up every week. Um, so I don't, I don't feel bad about checking in. I'm, I'm glad that we, we need those. No, that's a good point to bring up because some of us talk a lot, like me and Tylea, I think talk the most really. We're just like, wah, 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 and then we have to kind of be like, oh wait, okay. We got to let other people talk. So <laughs> I, I, you know, if I'm talking too much, just tell me like, Korea, I got to say something. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I am. I'm sorry. That's, She's so funny. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad. Yeah. No, I thank you. Friends call me. I'm, I literally will be talking nonstop for two hours. But the person's wow. in, and like then Robert's like, have you let them talk at all, Priya? That's like <laughs> No, I told them. Hey, hey, them. Oh, no. uh, my mom was like that. <laughs> yeah. I was I frustrated. It. I couldn't <laughs> get a word in edgewise. <laughs> yeah. I, I am. I'm sorry. But you can always tell me, Priya, I have something to <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so I love you guys. Thank you so much. We are going to be continuing the conversation about men versus women and their experiences that men have versus versus women have. And it, you know, I'm going to put a call out there, maybe on Facebook. And if you want to do that, also um, Priya on uh, uh, Instagram, like it, you know, on anyone who would like to share their experiences from the LGBTQ community, also. I mean, I'm all, I'm all about 
learning and being curious. So um, we are going to continue the conversation. Paul, um, and you're, I'm sorry, Brother Pete? Is Pete. that? Yeah, Pete. Pete. Yeah. Okay. Brother Thank you Pete. for presenting the masculine energy in the conversation. <laughs> yeah. Glad it's, to uh, <laughs> Me, he was. It works. He works for. Paul. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, you got to be surrounded by all these. Not. Uh, I'm. I'm not going to say ugly ladies, but. Uh, uh, yeah. all love me. I don't think people are ugly here. I just don't. Think they're love like. Me. For yeah, love me. Love me. It's not, not an unrelated form of beauty. That's what yeah. I mean. Yes. So, um, and I appreciate that because wow, it's too hard to, to live up to a standard, but yeah. um, I hope you guys show up next week, next Saturday, same time, same bat time, same bat time. What was the, um, the show called you mentioned too, the one with autism and the one. It's called with... Love on the Spectrum. Love on the Spectrum. And what was the other one? Push girls. The one with push girls, like pushing a wheelchair. Did you hear me? Girls. Push girls. Yeah, push girls. She got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, seeing all you guys. Bye. 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 Paul, I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> we'll see you all next week. Yay. Yay, thank you guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Enjoy your staycation. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> hey, I'm going in to give you a no shot to shut this down. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah.